welcome everyone uh, for, to joining us for another critical conversation with the Cecil Murray Center and the Center for Religion and Civil Culture. Um, I'm Reverend Najuma Smith Pollard. I'm the program manager for the Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement. And today we have um, as our guest panelists, uh, the CEO of Metro LA and Reverend Frank Jackson um, joining us today. But before we get into introducing them and getting into our conversation, I wanna set a little context. Um, we have been, the Murray Center has been working with our uh, part of uh, Metro's Faith Advisory Council um, for some time, and we know Reverend Jackson and others, and a lot of a number of pastors who have been a part of the Murray Center have been engaging uh, with Metro um, over the last few years. And so, throughout this pandemic, we've known that Metro uh, transportation has had to pivot, and we wanted to have a deeper conversation with the leader of Metro LA to find out what's happening currently. What was the pivot like and what's the future of transportation in the midst of a pandemic? And so we thank each and every one of you for joining us live on this conversation. And we look forward to having um, a rich, full conversation uh, with the CEO and with Reverend Jackson. Reverend Jackson is one who is engaged um, with Metro, with some of their youth programs. So we're going to hear from him as well. So without further ado, let's get into our conversation. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce um, Reverend Frank Jackson. He is one of the community li liaisons with the Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement, um, but also, again, part of the Faith, Faith Advisory Council uh, with Metro and been very engaged. So thank you, Reverend Jackson, for being on with us this afternoon. And then, of course, uh, the man himself, uh, Phil Washington, Philip Washington, who is the CEO of Metro LA and is doing a great job here in Los Angeles. And so we welcome you, Phil, today uh, as part of this conversation. And so thank you both for joining us. So here's what I'd like to kind of start with, uh, Phil. Um, we know that this pivot, um, everyone had to pivot in the pandemic, but we'd love to hear from you when, the, when it, when, you know, when the news first hit pandemic and everything had to change, just on a personal level, what was that pivot like for you? What were some of the first things that went through your mind? Well, first of all, uh, Reverend, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be on uh, with you and very happy to be on with my friend, Reverend Frank Jackson uh, as well. Uh, and thanks to both of you all for uh, being uh, voices in our faith leader collaboration. Uh, with Metro. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful three or four years, I guess, uh, that we have been uh, talking. You've been helping us uh, to design programs. So thank you for that. I think, I, I think just on a personal level, in terms of the pandemic, what struck me first was our human vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, with regard to uh, uh, us being on this planet and how uh, a pandemic could take a bunch of us out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is the first thing that struck me. Uh, and then, you know, uh, quickly and shortly after that, I started thinking about transportation, of course. Uh, but but the, the fact that we're vulnerable to so many things as humans and, uh, and that we're all uh, sort of, you know, on this journey and we're all in this together uh, really uh, has struck me, uh, uh, you know, as we've been navigating and matriculating our way through this pandemic. Now, you know, obviously the transportation piece of this is huge because, um, you know, we were quickly looking at essential workers, essential workers with the lockdown and all of that. We were looking at uh, uh, essential workers and it dawned on me then how important these people are to the foundation of our economy all over this country, and especially in uh, LA County. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it quickly pivoted for me to making sure that these people who do not have the luxury to telecommute, do not have the luxury to stay at home, uh, they have to go to work and they kept our economy going. And so, that is what drove us and me to make sure there was mobility provided for the people that were keeping this economic uh, 
system going? And so that's sort of a long answer to your question, but I think that um, without those essential workers, uh, to include uh, folks that work for Metro as well, uh, bus operators, rail operators, but also those folks that were going to the grocery store uh, working, those nurses, those uh, uh, folks that were putting their lives on the line uh, in, in uh, March and April early on, uh, that is what struck me. Wow, wonderful. Uh, what were any surprises in the beginning? Any surprises that surprised you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were uh, a ton of surprises, I think, uh, for us. Um, and I, I think many of them centered around the logistical uh, parts of this, the inventory, inventory of masks, inventory of uh, personal protective equipment, um, uh, making very good and quick decisions, um, you know, that came with the pandemic. And you know, to be hit, I was talking on a Zoom call about an hour ago uh, with um, the CEOs uh, in Washington, D.C. of the Transit Agency and some other places. And uh, what I was talking about is not only were we hit with the pandemic, but the social unrest that came with the murder um, of George Floyd, that created, I think, a whole nother set of dynamics, not just for uh, transit agencies, but the country. Uh, but the surprises for me uh, were how essential our services were to the essential workers in LA County. And, and I'm so grateful that you brought up um, George Floyd and um, other issues in that community. Layered up as well at the same time. Um, because, Met, because like, as you mentioned, the education is so critical to, to the lives of people and to the economy. So how did you, how, what, how did you see Metro's role in also responding to the racial inequity um, and, the, and the call for social justice? Um, well, I, you know, I, first of all, let me just say that we are not, I don't consider this organization uh, as just putting buses and trains out. Now, you know, obviously that's our core business. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I went out uh, out front early on, uh, and I said to people, I support Black Lives Matter, uh, and I do now. Yeah. Um, and, and and you know, people said, well, you know, what? Why are you being so uh, blunt with this? Well, um, it's important to say that Black Lives Matter because there was a time constitutionally when Black Lives did not matter. Exactly. Uh, when um, uh, black folks were considered three-fifths human. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so constitutionally, and even uh, from a, a theology standpoint, which obviously you all are much more versed than I, um, but, you know, uh, it, it wasn't that long ago where, uh, where, you know, ministers were getting up in the pulpit and justifying uh, why black lives did not matter, yeah. you know, years ago. So, so I think that uh, in our role, it was important in a mobility role. It was important for us to say, it was important for me to say that black lives do matter. Yeah. Uh, and I stand by that um, because of the reasons that, that I just laid out. And so from from being the catalyst for affordable housing uh, to uh, dealing with the homeless crisis, uh, to reduction in fares, and even talking about a fareless transit system. All of these things uh, are capital projects where we are hiring ex-offenders uh, and, and local hire in various communities. All of that uh, make for uh, LA Metro being much more than just putting buses and trains out. Right, right. Wonderful. Thank you, Phil. Frank, I want you to jump in for a minute as a pat, as a as a faith, faith, faith leader here in Los Angeles and one who's been engaging. Um, you, you're one of our community liaisons at at the Murray Center, but also you've been engaging closely closely with um, Metro. And I'd love to hear from you um, with what how you've been in this in this pandemic working with Metro with some of their youth programs and 
the advantage of that in, a, in times like these? Uh, uh, real important. One of the things, and, and welcome to everybody. Uh, and when, when this pandemic came up, we had just completed one of our prep meetings uh, for the internship program. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic uh, came out. And then our concern was, was Metro going to continue this internship program? Uh, you know, for the high school and uh, college students, and and it 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 kind of dawned on me the the importance of it when uh, we spoke to Miss Colston and she said that they were going to do it. You know, and uh, one of the uh, the main supporter of it was Phil Washington, mm -hmm. uh, because again, ha having these high school students and then creating this pathway, uh, this career opportunity pathway through this pandemic, I know it had to be difficult because over the last, what, 20 some years, the uh, internship program was always one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but then again, to see how not only the Metro staff, uh, the volunteers, the parents, and also the students were able to make this pivot and then do this, uh, do a virtual uh, uh, internship program and then see how well it turned out, uh, you know, was, was real number one impressive. And also it showed me the importance, uh, you know, of how, you know, Metro saw you know, this opportunity for these young folks that because when we go through this uh, 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 pandemic, mm -hmm. there's still going to be something after. Mm -hmm. And if some of the numbers that uh, Phil and Metro had highlighted is over the next 10 years, they're going to lose probably 50% of their workforce. So again, it was still, it, it was, it paid, placed that much more of an importance, uh, you know, on this, on your, on this opportunity, because now you're looking at how you're going to fill in. Uh, and then having these students, these high school students, work through this pandemic, I saw the growth in them. Uh, I saw exponential growth in these young folks because they were forced to do, the, the students had to pivot. You know, the staff had to pivot and it really did highlight the importance and the commitment, uh, you know, that, that Metro uh, has had over the four years that we've been affiliated, uh, you know, with Metro in this panel uh, and, and on the council. And also to see, you know, that commitment and see the enthusiasm uh, right. of the students and also the parents. Right, wonderful. Thank you for that, Frank. And I think one of the things that, that people forget about Metro Field um, is your com the commitment or what, not, not say forget, but are, are not aware of mm -hmm. is how um, Metro is working diligently to engage the youth of Los Angeles and, and abroad. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Because that when we talk about you know where we go from here and the pandemic, um, the investment has to be in our young people, our black and brown youth. And so talk to us a little bit about how you're addressing the systemic issues by including our youth and young adults in this conversation around transportation, um, which is something that people often don't even think about as an industry for future. Yeah. you know, and careers and things like that. So please share that with us a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, let me let me say first that mm -hmm. what we have been trying to do uh, here at LA Metro, and, and quite honestly, uh, you know, I've been working on this since I've been in the industry. Uh, I've been in the uh, transportation infrastructure uh, industry and just infrastructure in general. Mm -hmm. uh, for a little over 20 years. And prior to that, I was in the United States Army for almost 25 years. And I was thinking about infrastructure then when I was in the Army too. And it was kind of called nation building in other countries and, and that kind of thing. So uh, I think the first thing in our communities is to humanize infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We need to explain to people what we're talking about. I'm, I'm, when I say we, I mean like me and the folks in the industry. We, we have to explain to our kids. Now, uh, you know, like the internship that Reverend Jackson just talked about that we've been doing for 20 years and that we did even during the pandemic, we did a virtual internship. Um, these kids, they are not really familiar when they walk in. And so from Reverend Jackson saying he saw the growth, he saw the growth, that's because they were educated on what infrastructure is. And so I think that becomes very important, especially to our kids of color in our low income community. We got to explain to them that, hey, this is what we're talking about. We're talking, you see that sidewalk over there? We're talking about rebuilding that plus right. the whole community. We're talking about rebuilding rail. We're mm -hmm. talking about building rail. We're talking, doing all that. So I think 
That's the first piece, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. humanizing it, explaining it to them. The second piece then is to create a pathway for them yes. in this industry. Yes. Because what people don't understand Absolutely. right now, and we don't have a long-term infrastructure bill yet, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to have in the next few months, a trillion dollar infrastructure bill, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. trillion and a half. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. now in my mind, <laughs> one, that's a lot of money. Right. 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 And two, our children must be involved in that. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I mean, their Metro alone has 900 functions, mm -hmm. uh, career functions, just at Metro alone. Mm -hmm. And people just think bus and rail operators. That's mm -hmm. fine. They're right. important. We got 900 different job classifications. Right. Right. 900. Right. Yeah. So I think when we talk about infrastructure yeah. and we create, like we've done here, this pathway. Yes. Uh, so now the youngster, we started initially with the internship program. So this is a cradle to grave approach, mm -hmm. right? The cradle was usually the, you know, the high school internships. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I start thinking about that, the thought was we got to go younger, mm -hmm. which is why we just broke ground on a high school mm -hmm. uh, on Vermont and Manchester that hopefully we can talk about. So this- oh, yeah, Absolutely. Will. Yeah. <laughs> this cradle to grave approach says- youngster starts in a high school and they matriculate through the industry and we've got this on paper mm -hmm. and the grave i hate to use this analogy but the grave is the ceo position right right so they can matriculate through this pathway and they can visually see it right. and they can say this is where i am now and this is how i move through this pathway i think those are the things Mm -hmm. that we can do in the infrastructure space. And I'm not just talking about transportation. Right. I'm talking water. Yes. I'm talking, uh, you know, sewage. I'm talking all sanitation. I'm talking public works. All of this, we've had these conversations with all of these people that are leading these institutions. And that was why for me as a faith leader, as a pastor, when um, a few years ago, when, when you started inviting the faith community in to meet with you and discuss ways of engagement, um, cause I can, I have to admit, I, I had not looked at infrastructure as a means of, you know, leveling out to some degree racial inequity, right? Uh -huh. Because we tend to just be consumers of transportation or consumers of electricity or consumers of gas, mm -hmm. as opposed to engaging the industry and really, um, you know, being part of the, 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 the building and the sustaining of our communities. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we look at the racial inequity and the pandemic, this, what I see as an opportunity when we engage black and brown communities to be a part of the infrastructure, you know, work, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. um, because oftentimes we're just, we're just consumers. We're on the outside. We're just taking, we're just using the product, but we're not helping to build it. We're not helping to make decisions about it. And so that for me as a pastor was why it was so important to be a part of, of the conversation that you've been having for the last few years with, with the faith community, but also pushing and encouraging employment because you also have done some work for uh, those who are for reentry. Um, and so you want to talk about that a little bit and then I want, definitely want to talk about the school that's coming up or let's talk about the school first and then we talk about reentry since we're talking about young people. Yeah. So Manchester. Yeah, yeah, and I'll just briefly talk talk about it, and Reverend Jackson knows about uh, this effort as well. I mean, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we we were thinking that we had that gap, you know, mm -hmm. that 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 younger uh, uh, child gap uh, mm -hmm. in the infrastructure pipeline, um, and so we partnered with um, Supervisor Mark Riley Thomas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We we. Uh, you know, shared the idea with him to start a school. And he jumped on it. I mean, like nobody, I mean, he said, hey, I know the spot. And for hit in his leadership to get the county to acquire that through eminent domain was no small task. Uh, you know, that spot has been vacant since 1992 
since the Rodney King uh, riots and the so now, I mean, this is, and when we broke ground on this school last week on the 21st, I talked about at that groundbreaking is this is what good government can do, right? It really is the good it can do with a partnership and all that with the community. But what we're doing here is we are building a high school grades nine to 12 it's a boarding school concept. These kids will stay from Monday to Friday. We're focusing on kids in the foster care system. We're focusing on kids um, who, whose parents are in the justice, uh, have been experiencing the justice system. Um, uh, on that site will not only be the school, uh, but it will be uh, about 150 units of affordable housing. It will be a large grocery store and otherwise a food desert. It will be a transit plaza. There will be a innovation, innovative training center on that site where people in the community can come in and get trained. At the school, the areas of study will be engineering, infrastructure technology, transportation operations, urban and regional planning. Uh, so we want kids to plan their own community um logistical and supply chain management all of these things uh we uh are building in that school we've got the funding went to the metro board uh and the metro board agreed to fund the first 15 years of operation at 75 million dollars went over to the county they matched it at 75 so we got the operating money for the next for the first 15 years of the school we got a contractor that's going to run the school. They are going to be recruiting both kids, teachers, and administrators. So these are the things that we can do to get our kids ready uh, yeah. to work in the infrastructure space. And lastly, I would say that the vision, yes, and there'll be 485 kids in the school. Uh, we'll start with the ninth grade and go all the way up, but the vision is for LA County to be the infrastructure center of excellence. Mm -hmm. That all over this country where infrastructure needs to be built, uh, that people will say, if you want the best infrastructure young people, you go to LA County yeah. and you go to the seed school on Vermont and Manchester. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Wonderful, yeah. And I, I, I am a supporter of the seed school and I'm coming, I live just a few minutes from Vermont and Manchester. Oh. And I, I'm sure you're going to make sure that the homeless encampment there, the people are dealt with with dignity. I know that you'll do that. Yes. I trust and believe you'll do that. Um, and, and so when we talk about this, um, the seed school and engaging our communities, so they're part of the infrastructure work, which again, you know, I want to just encourage those that are watching live and those that are watching the replay, like this is, this is one of those ways in which we begin to, um, heal our communities is by being part of the, the infrastructure and not just the consumer. Um, I want to talk a little about barriers of entry, right? Um, and, and, you know, I know you talked about the fearless entry. What other ways, what other ways is Metro um, working to remove barriers of entry so people in this pandemic, and we know now the numbers are going up higher, you know, what are some, some areas where barriers of entry, barriers of access really um, what, what's Metro doing for that? So people understand um, how important transportation is and really meeting the needs of people in the midst of a pandemic with through transportation. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think two things. One is, uh, as you know, we've got an election next week. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> now, I mean, one of the candidates mm -hmm. has said and pledge that 40% of infrastructure dollars, 40% mm -hmm. would be spent in disadvantaged communities. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're looking at 1.5, a $1.5 trillion mm -hmm. infrastructure bill, and if the commitment and pledge is that 40% will be, uh, be directed towards uh, uh, low-income communities, mm -hmm. and 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 we're talking about all kinds of infrastructure. We're talking about broadband. 
we, yeah. we're, we, 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 you know, we got kids now that live, live in the urban areas. They got to go near Starbucks to get uh, yeah. Wi-Fi to do their homework on the, uh, on, on the laptop. I mean, yeah. so one, we need to be mindful that there's a lot of infrastructure money out there and we got to figure out and work with the community. This is not just a Metro. This is working yeah. with uh, USC. This is working with you, Reverend Smith Pollard, you, Reverend Jackson, to figure out how that money gets into the community. Yeah, absolutely. Because I'm trying to figure that out myself. Right. Uh, I think this school ought to be paid for with a chunk of federal dollars myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one thing to be educated on that. The other thing that we have been pushing very hard, and we've, we're taking some incoming fire mm -hmm. on this, but I'm used to taking incoming. Right. Um, and that is this idea of a fearless system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, what we're saying is that transit should be free for everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, so I've been sort of like an infrastructure evangelist around this issue, right, of saying that we have a moral obligation to L.A. residents, especially those of low income, mm -hmm. uh, to help our region recover from the pandemic and the effects of the lack of affordability in housing in this region. We know that housing and transportation are the two biggest expenses for any family. Yes. So now I give the example of a family of four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A family of four, you got two kids, you know, and you know, uh, you know, husband and wife or whatever. So if you got the two kids that are in high school they both need a transit. Let's say they're taking transit. They need a transit pass. Let's see. Let's say that each uh, each one of them have to have a hundred dollar pass. Mm -hmm. That's two hundred bucks, right? Let's say one of the uh, parents are working and they take transit and they need maybe a hundred and fifty dollar pass. I don't know, but that's three hundred fifty dollars. Right. Now, if transit uh, is is uh, you know fareless. Mm -hmm. Then you put three hundred fifty dollars back into that house. That could be the difference uh, uh, from them being homeless, right? Or that could be the difference with them from them affording where they live or being able to afford. So, what we're saying, and and we're saying, we can prioritize this because it's a matter of priorities, right? Right. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Because if I take this to my board of directors. <clears throat> they can say this is important. We're going to fund it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now we collect two hundred fifty million dollars a year in fares. Yes. Yes. But that two hundred fifty million dollars is only thirteen percent of my operating costs, which mm -hmm. means that I depend less on fares than probably any other large transit agency in this country. And that, that shocked me. I'm sorry. That surprised me when I was listening to your presentation. I know Metro did an official presentation on fair. Yep. And that surprised me that fair is a very small part of your of your budget. That's I was right. surprised to hear that. And I don't and, and that's the thing. That's why this conversation is so important. And we want to encourage people to get engaged with Metro and we're going to give out some more information. Is because I as people don't realize like how massive metro you know transportation is and the ways in which funding uh, happens and i was i was very surprised at that yeah yeah well i'll stop talking i mean you know no, no. <laughs> I, I mean no 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 but you're right um because as soon as uh you know i presented this in august to the board mm -hmm. you know i got a call from uh the president of new york mta she called me she said phil what are you doing because you're now putting pressure on these other agencies. Yes. But their fair box recovery, that's what that 13% is called. Mm -hmm. Their fair box recovery is like 40%. Mm -hmm. So they depend more on the fares than mm -hmm. we do here. So mm -hmm. my point with this is we are in a better position here in LA Metro to do this if that is your priority, mm -hmm. board of directors. If this is your priority, uh, instead of, instead of, uh, uh, killing me by a thousand cuts. And what I mean with that is motion after motion to reduce fares for, let's say, all left-handed kids that wear glasses. Mm -hmm. I mean, it costs me more to administer that. Right. What I'm saying is I'm ripping off the Band-Aid 
and I'm saying it should be free for everybody and and we should offload our fair collection function cost mm -hmm. and that would actually we we would need less money yeah. to make it fairless if we got rid of the cost it it takes us to collect fares right. you, you, right. you know, i understand yeah yeah and and i know what i call the the transit industrial complex they're going to come after me. These are the folks that fix our fare boxes. And, you know, I, I may need police, police protection myself. <laughs> it's all right. You're used to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, uh, Reverend Jackson, I want you to jump in on that. Um, as a community leader, how do you, you know, how do you see these types of uh, changes and shifts benefiting our community or not? I'm, not, I, I'm just curious about your thoughts. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's ironic that uh, uh, Phil uh, uh, brought that issue up of how, how not how little, but that 13% uh, mm -hmm. of their overall uh, being on the Edison board. It, it surprised me in one of my first meetings was finding out that, you know, the, the utility bill that the customer pays to Edison mm -hmm. is a small amount of what the overall budget of Edison. Uh, and, and then again, really being able to see and tie that into the community, mm -hmm. because that's a big issue. Uh, one of the things that we highlight you know, from, from that Edison side is if we can show a person how to save on their utility bill, that money can go back into the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's an infrastructure issue. Same thing with what Phil is saying. If, if, if he can go and get the support, because to do something like this, he needs more than board support. Uh, he's going to need some community support as well. Uh, and I believe that's where the faith-based community can come in. Uh, you know, added sometimes just, you know, just by the pastor saying it over the pulpit. Or, or, you know, when, 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 when Phil uh, calls together a, a, a convening, you know, to be able to come and really be there at the board meetings. Uh, because when you're talking about taking, when you're talking about taking $250 million out of something, even though you say it's only 13%, people hear $250 million. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> where is that $250 million going to be replaced? Uh, and, and again, being able to highlight, uh, you know, the advantages. I mean, even from the point of if you're not having to collect fees, you're, you're also going to save on the security end because now right. you don't have to deal with the security, you know, of, of that $250 million that you're collecting. So, again, having the more we enlighten the community and enlighten that faith based community, it also gives Phil that, that support, uh, you know, that pie, pipe of support. Uh, because anytime you say you're going to take something out, that's been in use for how old is Metro? Uh, yeah, 30 years. Yeah, so Metro has been creating, you know, Metro has been collecting funds for 30, you know, fares for 30 years. And to say, I'm going to cut that off, it takes a lot of support and uh, just looking at the, 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 the complexion of a Phil Washington as well. Or uh, you to come in and say, we're going to do this. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, th that I'd like to ask the question of, you know, how has being you know, a black chief executive officer in this industry, what's been the impact and, and some of the hurdles, you know, when you come up and say, we're going we're gonna to take these fares away. You know, have you gotten any tension and, and got any feelings of just being, you know, th you know, this brother making this decision? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the answer is yes. I mean, uh, uh, but you know, I won't let that hinder me uh, because because I you know it's a it's a greater power that we are uh, you know that we rely on. And uh, but there's no doubt that you know uh, here in America, our skin color speaks before we do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I I think that the greater good the greater good that can come of a fairless system, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for people to deny that greater good that can come of this. Right. Um, and understanding that actually 70% yeah. of Metro's ridership are low or extremely low income. Right, and and as we talk about justice, I mean it's it's almost yeah. you know when you when you when you look at those numbers, I think that's what that's why this conversation is important because if we're talking about creating systemic change mm -hmm. that that benefits the whole, but also serves the needs of those who are you know in challenged communities and low economic yeah. um, communities. 
it, it almost, it's almost a no brainer that we create system, we create, we remove barriers to entry and barriers to access. So people can, you know, easily get to, you know, parks and recreations or to the beach or to work or to school. Um, because what we do know is uh, communities in black and brown communities are already facing a number of barriers, a number of challenges just to um, engage in some certain levels. And so, so, you know, it just, it's a no brainer for me. I don't know. You know, probably the other one of the other things that I it, it's the you know the climate uh, uh, benefit as well. You know, if, if you can give people the opportunity to have uh, not to pay for a fare, it may drive more people into you know, doing public transportation, which takes more cars off of the road. Uh, you know, which reduces down the carbon uh, you know uh, uh, output that's coming. So there 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 really is a, a collective benefit uh, uh, to it. I believe the more people are educated in, in this environment. Uh, it's going to end up being a win-win for uh, uh, for everybody because public transportation is really the it, it, those cities that that, that have fully engaged it, it you know, they can see the benefit uh, uh, in it and because LA is so massive uh, you know in, in in space and territory uh, it, and sometimes it can be difficult you know but Metro has done a great job you know putting in new lines and and you know giving oper small business opportunities. Oh, uh, you know, to uh, that small business uh, uh, community as well. And I'm I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Reverend Jackson. I want to shift into the small business field, okay. if you don't mind. Um, because you talked about infrastructure, and we know that Metro has, you know, we even has a great impact on small business, especially when I, you know, we look at areas like Crenshaw, right? Uh -huh. So, what is what's Metro's commitment as it's building stations, but also having to you know, impact communities where building is happening, right? What's Metro's commitment to residents, but also to all the small businesses that are impacted by the growth of Metro, you know, and, and in a good way, but there's, some, there's been some challenges. We can be honest about that. Um, you know, so what is Metro's commitment on going to small businesses and, and, and how has Metro created, um, pathways of entry for for new business entrepreneurs who yeah. want to you know be part of this great infrastructure that we're building or expanding here in los angeles and abroad absolutely uh well I, I i'm glad you asked that question i mean we have been very very robust and very very uh aggressive in developing our uh, small business programs and that mm -hmm. is set aside programs mentor mm -hmm. protege programs uh, uh, veteran, disabled veteran business enterprise goals. So we have all those goals uh, in our programs, um, uh, but at the same time, those businesses that are being impacted by construction, mm -hmm. um, we have created what's called a business interruption fund. Now that business interruption fund, you have to be directly impacted by construction. Mm -hmm. And I know people don't agree with that because they say, if I'm two blocks away from the construction, I'm still impacted. We want some of that money. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had to limit that to those that are directly impacted, meaning they're, you know, they're right there on Crenshaw Boulevard, you know, where the construction is going on. And so, uh, you know, they are uh, receiving grants. Mm -hmm. uh, we have paid out, um, you, know, uh, you know, 50, I think it's $50,000 uh, in one year, and that can be multiple in, in multiple years. And so that program has been very, very uh, successful. Mm -hmm. um, and we will continue to do that. I mean, we uh, are really the only agency in this country that are doing a business interruption fund. I mean, usually in other uh, organizations that I've been in, when you do these big projects, you know, the businesses just, they don't get anything. Right, right, and so right. we started that here uh, at, uh, at LA Metro. So that's a big thing. But I, I think the other big thing uh, is uh, one, the many opportunities that are available, mm -hmm. uh, and two, uh, how aggressive we've been in this small business area. Uh, one of the things that I did when I first got here, you know, there was this thing called good faith efforts. Yes. Uh, you, you know, good faith efforts. So the contractor could come in and the contractor could say, hey, listen, I can't find any minority businesses. Mm -hmm but I made this good faith effort over here. And the good faith effort could be, you know, almost nothing. It could be 
like uh, you know, I send faxes to right. all of the bit. You know, it's ridiculous. You posted on a we posted on a billboard that no one. Yeah. Could <laughs> right, that nobody could see. The billboard is in the alley, you know right. what I mean? Uh, and so we got rid of and eliminated good faith efforts. Uh, and so I told all the contract, don't come to me with no time about good faith efforts because we'll help you find uh, the minority businesses. So that's gone. Now, believe it or not, that good faith effort still exists at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We killed it at the local level because, you know, these projects are funded federally, locally. Yeah. We killed it at the local level. And then we petitioned the federal government to kill it, um, you know, at the federal level. They have not. Mm -hmm. And by the way, um, uh, at the federal level, this administration got rid of local hire. So mm -hmm. now you, I mean, if you got a project with federal dollars, you can't do local hire for a kid that's working right around the corner. Mm. You know, that had that preference. Now, yeah. we've kept that for locally funded projects. Mm -hmm. So it's things like that mm -hmm. that we we should be educated on. Uh, and can you imagine if the clergy took a position at the federal level and said, we want local hire reinstated? Mm -hmm. Man, that, I mean, the feds, they have never seen right. the... Um, the faith community energized in this area nationally. Right, right. And so that can come out of LA County too with our faith coalition. And I think those are some of the things that, again, you know, we're used to being consumers of infrastructure, we're, yeah. you know, and not being engaged. And so I know we're, our time is wrapping up. Yeah. So share with us ways in which I, you know, Frank and I both represent the faith community and we, like with a number of pastors, have been part of your conversations. And so our, you know, uh, intellect around the infrastructure and the need to, for our communities to engage infrastructure beyond just being a consumer um, is important. But what are ways in which the community can engage with Metro um, to be part of this infrastructure, be part of these conversations that can eventually with organizing, you know, reach the federal level. And I don't, I don't, I don't know how many people actually know that, you know, there's a local mandate and federal mandate and how do we change that federal mandate around local hire, which could, which could change a lot for a lot of people. Um, if, if we can get those kinds of things, systemic changes made. And that's really what this is about, right? Like engaging with the infrastructure to, to really bring about systematic change that benefits all communities, but it certainly speaks to the issues that black and brown communities are facing. Yeah. So what are ways in which community members, small businesses, nonprofits, churches, faith communities can engage with, with, uh, with um, Metro at this ticket yeah. of watch? Well, I, I think it's two or three things. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, Martin Luther King used to say, change does not roll in uh, on the wheels of inevitability. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be inevitable that this stuff happens, right? I, I think uh, what we'd like to do is to put together a primer, maybe, uh, a primer on what this infrastructure stuff means, right? Uh, and share that possibly on our website. We've got a great blog called The Source. Um, we can share this uh, primer information, uh, sort of infrastructure one-on-one -on -one with the faith community. Uh, we've done a little bit of that already. Um, and we could share it with community partners as well. Um, and so I think that is a start to lay out this primer of what all of this looks like. Mm -hmm. For example, I mean, right here in LA County, you know who was the author of the federal local hire uh, initiative at the federal level. I'm scared to know. Karen Bass. Okay. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Karen Bass. No, so that's she, good to know. I thought you were going to tell me something scary, <laughs> like like like, <laughs> like one of the sons. <laughs> no, 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 no. Karen Bass. Uh, you know, she authored it, got it passed, and then there was a pilot program mm. in LA County on the Crenshaw line. And when the current administration took office in January, 2017, that pilot program was stopped. Mm. So, so uh, if you talk to representative Karen Bass, if you see her, 
yes, you I can would. say to her, listen, thank you for authoring uh, Local Hire. Mm -hmm. And how about, you know, if there is a change in administration, how about we reinstate that on day one? Got it. Got it. You that's know? good. That's good to know. That's Absolutely. Know. That's a task. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's something that, that can be done. Absolutely. And our, our last question, this is for, for um, Reverend Jackson. What are your thoughts around community engagement as a pastor, as a minister? Where do you see opportunities for the faith community, but also just community at large to engage Metro? Because since you've been doing so much engagement, and then we'll wrap up um, in, in just a moment. Again, one of the things that, that is really, that inspired me was just the openness of Metro mm -hmm. uh, and, and the openness of the staff and and getting the information out one of the things that has really been a benefit we've been able to get nine of our kids you know that i've been able to tie in with various ministries through the through the internship program and then from that being able to uh meet and and be introduced to other people in the industry that also have internship programs so just you know sometimes just just connecting in uh, uh and really engaging yourself and then having us and then identifying what is your specific need uh, because there's, as Phil was saying, this industry is so broad uh, and there's so many opportunities in it that just by uh, a church could create a program that specifically targets Metro and, and the transportation industry. So really just engaging, uh, you know, engaging with sessions like this. Uh, and, and when those when those breakfasts that Phil has been sponsoring over the last couple of years, uh, you know, when, when you leave the breakfast, you know, have a specific goal in mind of what you want Metro to do, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, know, you know, what you want an Edison to do. What do you want a specific industry to do? Because, you know, we have the opportunity and have been blessed enough to have someone that looks like us mm -hmm. at the top. Right, right. We don't get that often. Yeah. Um, and thank you for that, Reverend Jackson. So, so finally, Phil, just, you know, what, what would you like the community that's watching this live and many will watch the replay What's something that they can, I know you talked about Karen Bass, and I'm certainly going to uh, make a mental note of that. And when I engage with her, oh, and you know, prayerfully, I'm, be, I'm believing God for a change in administration. That's, I'm going to just leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> My prayers are very clear. Um, but um, what, what is something that you would like to, what would you like to, the community begin to do after today? Well, I think, a, I, mm -hmm. sure, I think a couple of things. Um, you know, on, on this fareless system initiative, um, you know, I've set up a task force of about 20 people mm -hmm. internal uh, to study and present all the facts, identify, study, present all the facts, mm -hmm. offer recommendation on how best to do this. Mm -hmm. And we are going to come back to the Metro board in January, mm -hmm. and we're going to present all of this with the recommendation. Right powerful if the faith community mm -hmm. uh, listens to that, develops a, um, um, a, a support uh, role in that and speak out on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we, cause we're talking about, we carry pre-COVID 1.2 million people a day. Right, right, right. A day. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think support of that, understanding what we're talking about there is, is the first thing. Uh, the other big piece um, is to uh, continue to work with us, uh, like you and Reverend Jackson have done, on the opportunities for our young kids. Mm -hmm. um, we got to get, and not just the young kids, but ex-offenders. Yes. Uh, small businesses. We can get them into infrastructure uh, jobs. And, you know, 50% of our workforce at Metro are going to retire in the next five years. 50%. Right, right. And this is like what they call the silver tsunami. Gotcha. Right? <laughs> um, and, and, and so, but it's not just Metro. Mm -hmm. It's what we're trying to do is bring in these other folks like Public Works, the airport, Miss Gloria Gray over here as the, as the chairman of the board for water right mm -hmm. here. I mean, so all of these, infra all of this is infrastructure. So keep asking those questions of how black and brown kids can get involved and uh, ask these institutions to share those opportunities with the faith community, with other organizations, CBOs. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think um, demanding yeah. that uh, the leadership 
and the organizations, mm -hmm. in my case, look like the ridership that we serve. Got you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we sh on the boards of directors, mm -hmm. uh, in the senior leadership areas, uh, the faith community, other CBOs should be saying, hey, the leadership should look like the folks in the diversity in L.A. County. Right, absolutely. And I know Christina has sent information um, for those that are watching live and watch the replay um, that November 5th, you have your public safety advisory committee. Yes. Um, and that's another way of engagement. And so we are placing that link for everybody that's watching live. And we are we're so glad everybody's watching live. That link is in the chat on the live stream um, for the November 5th public safety advisory committee. Um, and that's another opportunity for engagement. So we want to invite every, well, every, well, Christina has shared that with us to invite the community to be a part of that on November 5th. So check the chat for the link um, for the November 5th public safety advisory committee um, and which is accepting applications that we know of. It's applications are being accepted for that. Phil, I wanna say thank you for joining us today. We know you're really busy. Uh, but we appreciate your time and your commitment to make LA better. And uh, we're going to be continue to engage you and, um, and the faith community is going to continue to engage with you. Um, any final thoughts, any final words? Uh, I'm just happy to, that, that you had me. Uh, I said to one of the faith leader groups that, um, uh, you know, that, that, you know, Jesus was an infrastructure guy. I mean, you know, <laughs> right, because his earthly father was an infrastructure guy. He was a carpenter, right? Yeah. So bring. listen, this is God's work that we're doing here. I mean, it really is. We're building things yeah, uh, and making sure that people less fortunate have an opportunity. So yeah, that's Thank it. You. Yeah. So let, yeah, and I, I really appreciate the you know, just the, the expanding the idea around infrastructure and communities being really part of that, that work beyond just being consumers and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and paying into it as opposed to being part of the system. So thank you, Phil. Thank you, Reverend Jackson, for your time. Thank you, thank you everybody, for um, being tuned in live with us and for those that will watch the, the replay of this and stay tuned for more critical conversations with uh, the Center for Religion and Civic Culture and the Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Phil. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. All right, Rip. We'll yeah. see you around. Take care. All right. Bye -bye. All right. See you soon. Okay. Yes, sir.